Hey folks, David Stewart here. It's time for some more Lovecraft, your weekly Lovecraft. And this week, it's going to be The Whisperer in Darkness. This is a story a couple of you have requested that I do an analysis of. It's not my favorite Lovecraft story, which is not to say it's bad. It just doesn't fit in that category, you know, like one of my favorite stories. And there are some reasons why it's not my favorite, and some of it has to do with the way it's constructed. Uh, but nevertheless, the way that the story is constructed is still quite effective and is very effective, I think, in presenting the audience with the idea that the narrator can't really be trusted. So let me take a look at this story and talk about it a little bit. It's about a college professor who lives in the city and is a skeptic, shall we say, of some folkloric ideas from rural New England about monsters that wash up in the rivers. And through the story and through his correspondence with this guy named Akeley who lives out in the country in Vermont, he slowly converted from a skeptic into a true believer in these monsters. Now, what makes the narrator feel unreliable is a couple of things that uh, Lovecraft does not so subtly. And one of the things that he does is he continually reminds the reader that the correspondence that's being listed, it's told in a first-person perspective from the, from the perspective of this uh, college professor. The co correspondence that he's listing, these letters, are repeated from memory, that he has a perfect memory of them. And so by saying that he has a perfect memory of it, we start to immediately doubt that he's telling the truth because nobody has a perfect memory of things like that. So all the evidence that gets compiled through the course of the story, which is gonna be letters, uh, photographs of the tracks of these bug-like entities, as well as phonographs, recordings of uh, these bug entities talking to cultists like out in the woods. All of these pieces of evidence are lost and he's upfront with that. So we are asked to either completely rely on him as, uh, as the teller of the story in the absence of evidence or question whether we're hearing the whole story or what portion of the story we're hearing or how we understand it. Uh, and from that perspective, I think it's very effective. How it's constructed structurally is it starts off with, uh, with this skeptic thing and then we have a slow development of him being converted into a true believer. And at the same time, you have this ratcheting up of tension as we're receiving letters from Akeley that these monsters are trying to catch him. They're trying to intrude upon his farm. He needs to go live, live with his son in California. He has to keep go getting guard dogs from, from town to protect himself. And there's a big snap that happens in the last two chapters where he gets a letter where Akeley has done a complete reversal from stay away, stay out of this, they're coming to get me, to these beings from the outer outer worlds, these aliens, they're actually really cool and I need you to come meet them. And so when we have this, this moment happen, we as the reader begin to immediately question the actions of the narrator because he, he does what the letter requires and at the same time the narrator is like but there was such a 180 it's such a 180 it's like why are you going there he so he packs all of the, the evidence and proceeds to go take the evidence out to the country where Akeley is and we know uh, the reader knows right away that something is wrong something is very very wrong with this and the narrator should not um, should not be engaging in this particular quest but we really have nowhere else for the story to go so that's where it goes and one, that's one of the main reasons that this story is not my favorite, is that it just takes a little bit of a long time to get there. It takes a long time to get to that snap point where things finally happen and we get to in, embrace and experience the full horror. But because of that long buildup, it makes that moment that much more impactful. It's kind of like if you watch a horror movie and somebody runs up the stairs instead of out the door. You know, you know that they should be running out the door to escape, but they run up the stairs where there's no escape. Uh, they're running into the trap. Uh, it's kind of like that. We know he's going into the trap. And at that point in the third act, we get to see some of the full horror of, um, of what's involved there. And we get to finally figure out who the whisperer in darkness is as he uh, goes to meet his host, this person he's been communicating with who's like immobile in a chair. Everything feels wrong, and we know that it feels wrong in that final act. Now, if you haven't read this story, I'm going to have a couple of of spoilers as I as I proceed uh, but I do recommend it you know it's all it's all public domain so you can just go read this stuff at your leisure it's all online there's 
people who've done free audiobooks of it on YouTube that you can listen to. It's a it's a cool thing. It's a cool story to listen to if you like the idea of this. Now, there's some other ideas before I expose the the final bits of the act and talk about how effective they are. There's also some things that I think, uh, as far as the historical context of this story, are very interesting. So. Uh, this is one of the first stories that has monstrous aliens that I can really think of. And um, Lovecraft imagines them within the context of his Cthulhu mythos, and he uh, even expounds upon his mythos in the final few chapters uh, through the voice of Akeley. Um, and these aliens are, hey, they have wings and they have some way to travel through the other. And if you look at this and you realize that this is published, I think it was published in 1929. Uh, I, I could be wrong, so correct me if I'm wrong. But uh, I think it was published in 1929. At this point in time, Pluto was brand new. It was just discovered. And so because he's telling the tale in the past, he gets to uh, tell the tale from a perspective where Pluto, the ninth planet, had not yet been discovered, uh, that they were just maybe discovering they think there might be a ninth planet out past Neptune, but they don't know anything about it. Um, and so we get to kind of be on both sides of it with this story. Uh, the the past it hasn't been named in the in the present where the narrator is talking it has been named. And it, of course in this he mentions that they travel through the ether. This is before we really knew what was out in space, like what was out past the atmosphere or past the Earth. Um, there wasn't a lot of knowledge there because we hadn't sent up any spacecraft yet. We didn't know if there was more. So people had this idea that there was like an ether. There was some sort of substance in between us and stars. So they called it the ether. Um, and we didn't have this idea that there was a vacuum. There was nothingness between us and the stars, uh, like an endless nothingness. So they, their wings allow them to fly through the ether somehow, even though we understand it's harsh or inhospitable. This planet that they have, um, which I'm trying to remember the name of it. I can't remember it off the top of my head, but it's it's the planet Pluto, is where one of their outposts is, and it's so far from the sun that the sun just looks like a, you know, bright star on the horizon, and it, they don't need light, they don't need heat. Um, there's a lot of fantastical descriptions of this. All of this surrounds this context of scientific discovery that was occurring in the 20s, 30s, and 40s. Um, new ideas in astronomy. There's mentions of Einstein and physics and things like that. It's a, it's a very interesting from a historical context what a science fiction writer came up with the scientific knowledge that he had at the time. And I think it makes the story, you know, even though we know more about how things work now, I don't think it makes the story any less effective the way that Lovecraft constructed it. I think it's very interesting. Now back to the final act. I'm going to talk about a couple of things that I think make the final act just so frightening. And effective. First of all, we have an uneasy feeling all the way through it. When we get to the farmhouse, he's taken there by a stranger. Uh, he's asked to leave things where they are. His host won't get out of the chair. His host whispers and sits in the darkening, darkness. He's the whisperer in darkness. And he explains some really horrific things about these aliens, but he explains it in a way that is admiring of the aliens. Um, one of the things is their ability to remove a human brain and to put it into a cylinder which would preserve the living brain. And then they could attach things to the cylinder which would allow the brain um, to see and hear and feel and talk. And this is uh, also an interesting part of science fiction, this idea that the brain is somehow contains us as a, as a person. Uh, and we see the removal of brains and preserving them in many science fiction that follows this. And I'm, it's in Alita, right? It's in Alita Battle Angel. There's uh, the removal of the brain and putting it in a tank. So we have these, these metal cylinders which have brains. And one of them, the host instructs the narrator not to take down. And we think it might have his Akeley's name on it. And we find out it does have Akeley's name on it later. Now, the last few chapters, there's a couple of interesting execution things that Lovecraft does to sustain the tension. Remember, horror is all about how you play with tension. It's not just about horrific images like a brain in a, in a cylinder, but it's how you play with it. So the brain in the cylinder, we understand that that's horrific and horrible and um, in, in some ways like a transhumanist um, uh, macabre horror. But the fact that the other person, this whisper in darkness sitting in the chair whispering at a high volume whisper, doesn't find it disturbing 
is itself a disturbing aspect. So when somebody is not disturbed by that which is uncanny, we have an uncanny feeling about it. It's a very effective use. Another thing he does is he'll say, you know, there's a, he tells you that he runs out and he gets in Akeley's truck and runs away because of how horrific he sees things. But he doesn't tell you what the things that he are he sees. Uh, that what he, he doesn't tell you what he sees until later. And so in an interspersed between these moments where we really want to see the horror that he saw, he has these paragraphs of, of kind of going off on this other direction. Let me describe this thing before I go back to what you actually want to see. So through his use of prose and uh, putting interesting elements out of order, out of chronological order from how they would be told in the story, he prolongs the moments of tension and makes them that much more frightening so that he's able to end the story with this really frightening revelation, which is he goes into the study before he runs away and he tells you that he screams. Then he goes on and tells you a bunch of other stuff. Uh, then he comes back to finally at the end tell you why he screams. And he screams because his flashlight lingers on the chair where there's an empty dressing gown, which is that's what the, the farmer was wearing. And the second time he looks, he sees the perfectly preserved face and hands of the farmer. And so we, we immediately infer, he doesn't tell you exactly, but we infer as the reader that there was one of these aliens like wearing the skin and the body of this farmer and his brain was actually in the cylinder up on the shelf. And that's what we piece together with the reader. It's never spelled out explicitly, but Lovecraft drops in these details at the end to let you construct the horror yourself in your own mind. And it's as horrific as your own mind can imagine it. That's the skill in it. And the skill in spacing these details out and and putting paragraphs of prose in between them to, to lengthen that tension is all the better. So that's uh, that's the way the story ends, and it's really, really effective. So the ending, I think, makes all of the getting there, which to me is a little bit too slow, um, a little bit too slow, in my opinion. Uh, maybe not for you, but for me, I think it takes a little too long to get there. It's what makes that journey worth the arrival. The arrival point is definitely very good. So that's The Weekly Lovecraft, Whisper in Darkness. Of course, you can get my books on Amazon. My newest ones, these are both 99 cent short reads, uh, take about two hours to read them. Um, Voices of the Void, this is like Lovecraft meets Aliens. It's sci-fi horror. Uh, Crown of Sight is is a high fantasy, but there's definitely dark fantasy elements in it. So if you like horror, both of these will probably have some elements you like in them, especially this one, which uh, um, I'm found a rather interesting experience to write and I've gotten lots of positive feedback on that. So check it out. They're 99 cents on Amazon. Uh, Crown of Sight is available on all other platforms, but this one is Amazon exclusive. And so you can read it for free with Kindle Unlimited if you want to. And of course I have my other books too. If you're interested in horror elements, Muramasa Blood Drinker has some great horror elements, horror elements in it, as you would expect from the name Blood Drinker. So thanks so much for watching and I'll see you guys next time.